So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research You need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang papapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga polisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas 
sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DBRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have specific goals, um, do research, and 
make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the PIDS webinar series where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of emerging and current development issues. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. Biotechnology holds much promise for modernizing agriculture and addressing problems in agricultural production. 
In this webinar, we will talk about modern biotechnology application in the Philippines and how it is being regulated. To officially open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta, Jr. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the uh, presence of the following uh, who choose to be with us this afternoon uh, from the government. We have Senate Economic Planning Office Director Circes uh, Nitafan, the National Economic and Development Authority Assistant Director Richard Emerson Ballester, Department of Foreign Affairs Assistant Director for European Affairs Charlson uh, Hermosura, National Academy of Science and Technology Academician uh, William Padolina. From the private sector, we have uh, Masses Corporation CEO Alex Timbol and Cartier Philippines Incorporated Director Christopher Ilagan. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following University of the Philippines Los Banos Professor Emeritus Dolores Ramirez, uh, uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Director Rofo Buesa, and University of San Jose Recoletos Faculty Association Incorporated President Roberto Cabardo. From the CSOs, NGOs, INGOs, we have a US ASEAN Business Council Country Representative Margie Lim and Masaganang Sakahan Incorporated Director Daniel Agustin. Let me greet our friends from the media. And finally, let me also greet our guests, uh, colleagues from government, academy, civil society, media, the private sector, and those watching through the PIDS and SERPI Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Today, we will talk about modern biotechnology applications and regulations in the Philippines. Biotechnology is the modification and improvement of living organisms from living genetic materials, according to the International Service for Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications. Under this umbrella is modern biotechnology, which employs genetic engineering, genetic technology, genetic modification, and gene manipulation to produce genetically modified crops. Despite being contentious, uh, modern crop biotechnology is considered a novel solution to the long-standing problems of food insecurity, low crop productivity, pest and disease prevalence, micronutrient de deficiency, particularly in developing and climate vulnerable economies. Its benefits have also encouraged the development of genetically modified organisms and related products. Biotechnology is not new in the Philippines, having been introduced to the concept way back in, 19, in the 70s. Uh, the country uh, was also among the first to adopt biotech, biotech crops, introducing Bt corn in the early 2000s. However, barriers such as lengthy and uh, stringent regulatory processes and high technology de development costs have hindered the advancement of modern biotechnology in the country. This afternoon, we will feature the study, Modern Biotechnology Applications and Regulations in the Philippines, Issues and Prospects, authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Sunny Domingo and Research Specialist R.V. Joy Manihar. The study looked into the enabling regulatory structures for modern biotechnology in the country to determine entry points for improvements. The study also conducted a case study on genetically modified eggplant to estimate the welfare benefits and potential opportunity costs for consumers and local growers. The presenters, Dr. Domingo and Ms. Manihar, will talk about modern biotechnology policy, institutions, and regulatory regimes. Uh, they, are also provide, they will also provide uh, recommendations on how the government can reduce the substantial opportunity losses from uh, inefficient regulation. To enrich our discussion, we invited two experts to hear their uh, insights on the topic. We have Dr. Director Vivicencio Mamaril of the Department of Agriculture's Bureau of Agriculture and Fisheries Standards and National Academy of Science and Technology Academician Yefimio Rasco Jr., a professor emeritus at the University of the Philippines, Mindanao. We are deeply honored to have you both at this webinar. I encourage all our participants to stay until the end of the webinar and actively participate in the open forum. Thank you. And I now I'm giving back to the floor to the moderator. 
And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arbeta. Friends, I hope you paid attention to the recording of our house rules, which we uh, played before we uh, started the webinar. So just to repeat, um, you're very much welcome to join the open forum. So for those who are watching us on Facebook, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of your screen. And for those who are watching us on uh, um, Facebook, um, please uh, use the comment section. Uh, please make your questions or comments concise as we have limited time. Okay, so at this point, I now uh, invite all of you to listen to our featured uh, study for this webinar, which as mentioned by Dr. Arbeta, are authored by uh, Dr. Sani Domingo and Ms. R.B. Joy Manihar, and both of them will be presenting. Dr. Sani Domingo is a senior research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, and he has more than three decades of extensive multi-sector technical and policy research exposure in agricultural research and development and extension, natural resource management, and disaster risk reduction and management. Dr. Domingo is a member of the Technical Committee of the Philippine Agriculture and Fisheries Biotechnology Program and a member of the Council of Fellows of, of the Philippine Public Safety College. His current research interests include ecological integrity and environmental policy, technical um, agriculture and resource economics, and climate change and disaster risk management. He obtained his bachelor's degree and master's degree from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and his PhD in applied economics from the Orange Campus of Charles Sturt University in New South Wales, Australia, as a fellow of the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research. Meanwhile, Ms. Arby Choi uh, Manihar is a research, uh, research specialist at PIDS with environment, waste management, extractive industries, and disaster risk reduction and management as her research areas. She previously worked as a researcher at the National Fisheries Re Research and Development Institute on the value chain analysis of ornamental fisheries industry and contributed to a number of UN-funded development research projects. Um, hailing originally from Iloilo, she obtained her bachelor's degree in economics from UP Visayas. She recently earned a Master of Environment and Natural Resources Management degree from the UP Open University. So I now give the floor to our presenters, uh, Dr. Sane Domingo and Mr. Ms. Uh, Arby Joy Manihar. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Sheila. Uh, Arby will be presenting the initial slides and I'll be closing the presentation later on. So are we please? Yes, okay. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila and Sir Zani. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We are glad to present to you today the results of our study entitled Modern Biotechnology Application and Regulation in the Philippines Issues and Prospects. So uh, this is the outline. It's just there to give you a general flow of the presentation. So I will be tackling numbers one to five, while Dr. Sunny Domingo will focus on the challenges, key insights, and recommendations. So throughout this study, you will be encountering um, a series of concepts, and it is important that we define and qualify them first for us to have a basic grasp or understanding. So biotechnology is simply a set of tools that uses living organisms to make or modify, develop, or improve. And modern biotechnology falls under it. It is comprised, with, it is comprised of different technologies like uh, genetic engineering, gene manipulation, and genetic makeup. It's um, primarily, um, it primarily deals with the insertion or the manipulation of genetic material. And one of its products is, a genet is the genetically modified crop, or what we know as GMOs. So in that essence, uh, modern biotechnology proposes to solve um, perennial sectoral problems on food security, agricultural productivity, pest and disease resistance, and micronutrient deficiency. Okay, for a while. Okay, so um, as the climate 
climate events continue to worsen, the role of biotechnology is deemed as crucial in the growing demand for food and resources. So in the case of the Philippines, the introduction of biotech crops was through BT corn, and it was not immediately followed by other GM crops. So this prompted the study to review regulatory application and structures to investigate why this was so and to pinpoint areas for optimization and check and balance. So generally, the study determined the issues and prospects in the application and regulation of modern biotech in the Philippines agricultural sector. Specifically, the study reviewed policy and related regulatory processes, conducted case studies on technology development and commercialization, and recommended ways forward for agriculture and modern biotechnology. So in the international scale, around 71 countries have adopted biotech crops. It accumulated to around 190.4 million hectares, and the highest adoption is from soybean, followed by maize, cotton, and canola. And, uh, and as of 2019 data, Philippines ranked 12th, making it a mega biotech country. In the Asian production of biotech corn, Philippines contributes um, 0.9 million hectares. So this large, um, this large adoption figures are mainly attributed to high farm income benefits. It was estimated to be 200,000 million US dollars between 1996 to 2016, the highest of which comes from herbicide tolerant soybean. And in the case of the Philippines, BT corn um, returns a net income of 85 million. And for stack rates, it, go it goes as high as 6.422 billion. As for the environmental aspect, uh, biotechnology, um, there are studies that cite that biotechnology reduces pesticide costs and increased environmental benefits. So what you're seeing now is a table of active, ingre active ingredient usage from pesticides, and um, there is an estimated 18.4% change in environmental impact. It also decreased pesticide expenditure by 38%. And some studies have cited that biodiversity gains were valued at 150 billion US dollars. Okay. So in another study, the PSA cost and return studies in 2013 um, have noted that hybrid corn in the Philippines tend to have higher farm inputs. So as you can see here, they have higher um, figures for the usage of fertilizer and the usage of pesticides compared to their open pollinated variety counterparts. However, they also return as much as um, four times higher farmer net returns compared to the other uh, varieties. So in the domestic landscape, as mentioned earlier, BT corn was the first commercially available GM crop in the Philippines. It underwent regulatory process under Dow 20208, and it was relatively fast due to mature technology. It means that technology development is already finished and um, the country does not necessarily need to um, conduct further research on that area. So between the three islands in the three major islands in the Philippines, Luzon has the biggest adoption area for stack rates, followed by Mindanao. And interestingly, Visayas has lower figures for stack rates and highest for insect resistant BT corn. Generally, however, we see that there is high preference for stack traits over the two varieties despite their earlier adoption. So for context, um, insect-resistant corn um, started in 2003, herbicide tolerant in 2006, and stack traits only started in 2007. So among the regions, region 2 dominates in the figures. So which institutions 
and policies have been influencing our regulatory framework and processes. Here we provide you um, a timeline. It started in 1990 when DOST and CBP was established. And then um, in 2000, Philippines entered Cartagena Protocol. In 2002, DAA 02-2008 was um, issued and DA Biotech was the only assessor. In 2010 and to 2012, um, a series of field trials were conducted for a BT egg plant. And in 2015, the Supreme Court ruled against it based on the petition filed by um, Greenpeace, um, imposing the, um, invoking the rate of Calicassan, and um, it nullified Dow 2208. That led to the creation of JDC 2016-01, which um, added the OST and CBP as an oversight agency along with um, DA and added assessors like um, DNR and DOH. And in observation of bottlenecks and regulatory delays, JDC 2016 was further amended to create JDC 2101, which was just um, approved this March 2002. So it um, combined the assessing bodies into a single joint assessment group and in the future and in the future um, and in the future they are considering um, consolidating all of them into one singular biotech authority so we have observed that regulatory processes and events like um, the field trials of bt eggplant have led to transformations or became catalysts for policy changes and institutional shifts so is the JDC creation a terrible birthing? Did it add regulatory delays or was it a necessary precaution? Here we point out several um, um, key differences between the DA and JDC. So for the assessment, as you can see, there are added agencies there, DNR for environment and DOH for human health. For the consultation process before um, it only required officials from the LGUs, but now if if there are IPs present in the area or if it's within the vicinity of a protected area, there requires additional permits. And it now adds um, an LGU endorsement. For the public hearing, there is only one for DA, which is the field testing and it's optional. And for the JDC, it added confined testing and field trial phases. So I'm going to run through you um, the general process of JDC 2016-01. So the first one is the procedure for proposal. So the only way na um, makakapag ka if, the, if there is no alternative or foreseeable alternative um, with its domestic counterparts. And for confined tests, um, Public hearing is part of the process, but um, this is optional, and it will it'll only be it will only be conducted if it is deemed necessary by the um, by safety committees. And um, we will now proceed to the field trials. So, if there are multiple field trials, they are evaluated separately. And as mentioned earlier, added permits are required. If the field trial site is within or near ancestral domain or a nationally protected area, so they will coordinate with NCIP or PAMB, the Protected Area Management Board. And for the public participation, multi stakeholder consultation is needed and an LGU endorsement will be required. Um, for the direct use for feed, food, feed, and processing, there are added layers there. So um, there now comes additional evaluation from BPIPPSSD for food safety standards, um, Bureau of Animal Industry for feed safety and socioeconomic considerations to be evaluated by an external expert. For the procedure for commercial propagation, um, this will be conducted in parallel in parallel registration with um, FPA. So the if it's um, if it's um, insecticide resistant, um, they will need to register th register that with FPA. 
and um the addition of fpa came into play only in 2016 and another bottleneck um, possibility here is they request another efficacy trial so it's different from the field trials conducted so um it needs to be harmonized or streamlined to prevent um further regulatory delays and um seed distribution will also be um discussed in this process and it will only be allowed for sec registered bodies so so far there are 98 um, gm applications under gdc 2016-01 as of march um, 31 as of march 31 um, there is one approved field trial for golden rice and there are 58 direct use applications and for commercial propagation 12 um 12 events under bt corn were approved and golden rice is in the process so after that if ma approve yung golden rice um seed distribution will start taking place and soon makikita na siya sa market okay now we go to the key study which is the economic surplus analysis of bt eggplant So um, eggplant production comprises one third of crop vegetables, production value highest among similar crops. And in 2020, it amounted to 243,000 metric tons. The self-sufficiency ratio is for BT eggplant is 100%. So it means um, the domestic production is sufficient to meet the domestic demand for it. So compared it to the following crops, which also have GM counterparts, for corn, 91.4%, um, rice, 85 and potato, 81 However, um, our domestic production of eggplant is very susceptible to fruit and shoot barter. It results to about 80% yield loss, according to some studies. So, Ito po yung mukha ng um, fruit and shoot border. So it um, it attacks during the early vegetative stages, fruiting stages. And the event comes from Mahaiko or the Maharashtra Hybrid Company. And it is supplied in three countries. So Bangladesh, Philippines, and India. However, the brinjal, which is this one, is not preferred locally. So the UPLB IPB, bred it with um open pollinated um bred it with a local um variety and we now have f1 hybrid and open pollinated and according to field trials um there the farmer's preference is the hybrid variety so why bt eggplant it is the only event to undergo three regulatory regimes so dow 2002-08 so doon nangyari until field trials and then it was halted and GDC 2016-01 was, um, was issued and the Supreme Court reversed the decision and um, advocated for, for a precautionary approach or implementation of the biosafety framework. And it was granted biosafety permit granted for direct use. And it is now undergoing commercial propagation application under JDC 2101. So our methodology uses economic surplus analysis as an ex ante assessment of technology adoption under various market situations and assumptions within a closed economy model. The model was drawn from the work of Alston Norton and Pardi and the BT Eggplant study of Francisco et al. in 2014. So here are the assumptions. The adoption rate was um, the adoption rate was from an expert's opinion, and majority um, were proxy from existing data sets. So there are a series of sensitivity analysis under different scenarios. We'll first tackle the supply elasticity scenarios. Here we see that um, the more the supply reached elasticity, we're quantity supply changed at the same proportion with price, the lesser with IRR. 
the lesser the internal rate of return. So the IRR is greater when supply is relatively inelastic because um, considering the inputs, the production and seasonality and marketing of an eggplant, it cannot easily um, change along with price. And here we're seeing um, cost scenarios. For the base model, um, the IRR is 53.1%. So the higher the cost, the lesser the um, benefit. And um, regulation takes up 35% of development costs according to our key informant interviews. So, and here we're seeing that regulatory costs are really highest, and especially during field trials. And extension costs are also high. So this include travel costs, participatory processes, and these are the longest and most expensive um, phases of a regulatory process. For the adoption scenario, um, this, um, this kind of um, sensitivity analysis hopes to capture the consequences of delays or lags and efficiencies in the regulatory process. So for example, um, if an adoption starts as early as year five, it would result to more than 100% IRR, while a further delay of as much as um, three years, or it would start at year 12, it would decrease IRR to about 21.2%. So earlier adoption, higher IRR. And, and with this, um, I will just compare um, the timeline of regulatory process among GM crops. So there are really delays. Um, you can see here that um, it takes very, very long for, um, for, one to, for one GM crop to proceed to the next um, step in the regulatory process. So PRSV papaya, so far was discontinued since it has a lower efficacy than Sinta papaya. So hindi siya, um, it cannot, um, it's not efficient or it's not effective against PRSV. And P BT cotton will be entering its um, direct use application after its field trials. For golden rice, um, it will, it is undergoing commercial propagation. And for BT eggplant, um, it is also on, um, ongoing for commercial propagation. And with that, um, I'll pass on the mic and um, presentation to Dr. Sunny Domingo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, RV. So RV was able to present the, the status of uh, GM crop uh, adaptation in, in the country, as well as the application of uh, the regulatory framework uh, that we have. Uh, what I'm going to do is present to you key insights in terms of uh, what we've seen in us looking at uh, both national and subnational uh, situations, as well as uh, possibly look at uh, alternative courses of action moving forward. Next slide, Darby. Okay, as mentioned, uh, this, pre this presentation is actually divided into major components. First one is me uh, uh, summarizing the key insights from what we've seen uh, from our interviews as well as case analysis and the actual, actual uh, assessment of our regulatory processes as installed. And then uh, we'll go on and try to recommend possible ways forward. So on the development and uptake of biotechnology products on productivity, as RV mentioned earlier, hybrids are really three to four times more profitable than our open pollinated varieties. Uh, this is applicable to corn. GM corn um, cultivation further lessens uh, the use of uh, labor as well as lessens damages from, uh, from corn borer and the eventual waste on, on harvested commodities. 
GM corn adoption is highest in the zone. And as mentioned by our earlier, stock varieties are preferred. But if we're going to look at what we have in Visayas and Mindanao, there seems to be equal preference uh, on BT uh, corn as well as uh, Roundup Ready corn. Those insect resistance uh, as well as herbicide tolerant varieties that we have in the market. For BT eggplant, uh, what we've seen is really a very economically viable commodity. You know, even with us trying to uh, give the most uh, conservative assumptions in our estimates. And then for golden rice, uh, you have similar productivity with existing varieties, plus the added benefit of uh, micronutrients in the final product. So RV seems to have issues uh, in showing the presentation. Okay, on regulations, so we've seen a very stringent regulatory process. There have been delays in terms of, uh, for example, the application of BT eggplant as well as that of golden rice. Them actually taking uh, more than 20 years, now two decades from uh, technology development to now, which is the approval of uh, commercial propagation. So that's a very long uh, timeline for us to see uh, the eventual product from the laboratory to the actual fields of our farmers. So JDC 2016-01 introduced added layers to ensure environment and health protection in our system. But uh, in the same line, uh, this somehow extended a bit certain processes within um, within the policy that we have installed. So there have been massive opportunity, cost, opportunity costs uh, because of these delays and the uh, highly technical vetting process that we are looking at in terms of the process need uh, complements in terms of the organic structure as well as competent uh, personnel within our uh, bureaucracy. We've seen weak mechanisms uh, in terms of uh, revocation grounds pertaining to possible augmentations on monitoring evaluation as required for necessary checks. Further on regulations, we have seen high costs on technology development, investment, uh, particularly the, the whole R&D phase of these uh, uh, undertakings. So as mentioned earlier, more than two decades timeline from technology development to regulatory approval has been seen, particularly for BT eggplant and uh, golden rice. The approval period for GM corn actually took around seven to nine years, no? uh, way back early uh, or mid 1990s to, to early 2000s. But for GM rice and eggplant, we are seeing 10 to 13 years of uh, total required timeline from uh, them starting with the laboratory to actually uh, the bureaucracy approving commercial propagation. Regulatory expenses may be more than 30% uh, of the total investment, which is really quite huge. So it's not that easy for uh, potential technology developers or researchers to get into modern biotechnology research and eventually follow through uh, going through the required regulatory process we have within the bureaucracy. Next slide, Arvin. So in terms of end user uptake, we can look at market protection and uh, intellectual property issues. Intellectual property rights is outside that of biosafety jurisdiction. Patents are naturally skewed toward multinational technology developers. Uh, because right now, what we have in terms of uh, GM corn are products spoused by our multinationals. BT eggplant, as well as uh, GM rice, have local counterparts. Uh, particularly for BT eggplant, it's being developed UPLB, and therefore we have control eventually in terms of the final product and its marketing. High seed costs, uh, costs may hinder farmers in terms of their actual technology adoption. This invites the proliferation of substandard and ukai seeds. Uh, we have been 
hearing a lot of concerns with regard to IP protection of eventual GM crop products. No? And these include the proliferation of ukai ukai seeds. No? And uh, anecdotally, uh, they supposedly have captured around 15 to 25% of the seed market. So that's huge. There's no provision lodged in the current regulatory framework for IP, but there is a plant variety protection office within DA. So that has to be augmented in terms of uh, what we have within the bureaucracy. There is a need to enhance the link between technology development and industry uh, stakeholders. Uh, us looking at uh, seed production, distribution, as well as the acknowledgement of what we have on field in terms of the farmers' uh, seed systems. So our researchers at UPLB may be developing PTA eggplant, but eventually they'll have to market. Them. And that would require uh, linkage with our stakeholders, industry stakeholders. End user uptake, economic viability, and public welfare for BTA eggplant, all scenarios, as mentioned earlier, are viable with very positive net present value as well as very high IRRs or even the most conservative assumptions. Public participation mechanisms need revisiting, limiting exchanges during confined tests and field trials may not be enough to appease interest groups. So in our conversations with interest groups, those not pro-GM uh, commodities, uh, a key insight was them trying to look for avenues for exchange. So participation from our communities, from our interest groups, from CSOs probably uh, is very much needed in terms of what we have process-wise. Next slide, Herbie. So what I mentioned defined uh, the major areas uh, in terms of us possibly trying to look for augmentations. And what we have in our next slides are short to medium to long-term possible courses of action in terms of us augmenting what we have uh, regulation-wise in the country. So for short to medium term interventions, we need to ensure clarity in policy interpretation and implementation, including stakeholder roles and public participation. We need to enhance public consultation and uh, local stakeholder engagement intensify information education and communication campaigns to address acceptability issues on GM crops, as well as bridge the knowledge and perception gaps among uh, end users, as well as among stakeholders as a whole. Put up regulatory and enforcement mechanisms and standards on seed quality, price, distribution, as well as intellectual property. Address organizational structure stability and non-retention of institutional memory due to staff movement for continuity and procedural integrity. So we are looking at uh, just designated individuals looking at uh, functions within the regulatory processes installed. And that's not very much acceptable because uh, any uh, human capital investment that we have on those individuals eventually uh, dissipates no? as they move within the bureaucracy or probably outside in, in other cases. Increase human capital investment, personal development initiatives for both R&D and regulatory functions. So it's us augmenting what we have capacity-wise within the bureaucracy, us looking at the, personnel's, uh, the personnel involved in, in both research as well as uh, regulatory vetting, them being capacitated as they are within the bureaucracy. Augment uh, interdepartmental policy. Uh, this is partially addressed with the recently signed JDC, uh, I think signed last month uh, by the end of March. So harmonize regulatory flow with coordinated time frame and simultaneous evaluation. Conduct uh, risk assessments and uh, clarify areas of inconsistencies, including delineation of roles among bodies. Rationalize public hearing and community engagements, participations. Streamline assessment periods, rationalize renewal for food feed and processing, field trials, and commercial propagation. So it's us not only looking at streamlining policy, it's us also trying to open up the process, bringing in uh, avenues for, for exchanges of ideas, changes of insights as well. 
Next slide, Arvin. So what we have here is the latest evolution in terms of policy. So we have JDC 2021-01, past plus, plus month. With this, we have um, an augmented regulatory process. Still, we have the same institutions, DA, DOS, DNCBP, DNR, DOH, DIL, GBPI, IBC. But uh, in this case, we have the joint assessment group. So instead of us having so many bodies looking at different, different aspects of regulation or by safety, we now have a joint assessment, group, which is, I think, the more effective and efficient way of, of doing this. So we have a body, a body uh, trying to augment itself, possibly in terms of capacity and trying to also maintain the capacity within that set of individuals. In this case as well, there is exemption in terms of stock traits, uh, as long as the parent materials have been previously approved. The socioeconomic considerations have been also removed from the process as this is outside our biosafety concerns. A major um, change here is also the perpetual approval in terms of the validity of permit, and this is uh, contentious in terms of us also relating this to other stakeholders on modern biotechnology products. LGUs require uh, resolutions and the actual consultation timeline is less than 20 days. Uh, this is um, also with regard to our ease of business policy. Next slide, Arvi. So further pointing out the augmentations in our recent JDC. Uh, in terms of assessment, we have the, the JAG, comprised of the DA, DOS, CDOH, DANR, and biosafety committees. 10 days for individual review in each agency. As mentioned earlier, there is exemption in terms of the stack rates, as long as the parent materials have been approved and the socioeconomic considerations have been removed from the process. Permit-wise, you have as well the field trial, direct use, and commercialization stages of approval. The permits being given by the government will be valid in perpetuity as long as there are no grounds for its revocation. Now, this aspect has to be further uh, specified in detail in the IRR. Consultation-wise, um, in the new policy, there is only one uh, to be done during the field trial phase. Public hearing to be done in 20 days with general public in accordance with ARTA and the ease of doing business policy that we have in government. Next slide, Arvi. So for medium to long-term strategies, we have policy revision and institutional augmentation also as a way moving forward, a major way to, to actually augment what we have. Uh, regulation wise. So first, we can augment uh, the biosafety framework, EO514. Second, we can pass the well, a legislation on modern biotechnology uh, in whatever form, possibly leading to the establishment of a central authority on, on modern biotechnology. Augment the organic structure and Resource, resource allocation of DA biotechnology centers to support agriculture and industrial development. Harmonize policy with other countries, regional bodies, possibly open discussions on the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur protocol on liability and redress integral once GMOs are out in the market. So this is an international set of rules and procedures relating to living modified organisms as applied to damages, possible damages resulting to uh, the adoption of such GMOs and their transboundary movement. And then uh, eventually we need to capitalize on emerging opportunities and expand regulations to cover other uh, organisms as well as other concerns uh, in the market. So we can look at new plant, uh, new breeding techniques something that's outside modern biotechnology and therefore not included in the regulatory process that we have installed. We can look at uh, GM animal regulation. A lot has been going on in terms of us 
possibly looking at the entry of uh, GM animals, including GM fish and GM insects. Forestry products, microbial biotechnology as well. And then uh, in the market, uh, looking at low level presence of GM and GM products and possibly labeling of uh, what we have in the market commodity wise. So in the end, it's really us looking at balancing what we have uh, in terms of product safety and us trying to augment the requirements of the agricultural sector as well as the attached uh, industries down the line. So that's modern biotechnology you know, uh, as we see right now, uh, adoption wise and the government in terms of it trying to instill uh, a process that would safeguard both the environment and the health of uh, the consuming public. I think uh, this is the, the last slide. So with that, uh, we close our presentation. Thank you. Uh, we'll be waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sunny Domingo and uh, Mr. Ms. Arby Joy uh, Manihar for your uh, for sharing us your study and uh, for giving us um, in, um, insightful and practical recommendations. So we will hear more from our uh, presenters during the open forum. So um, let's continue the conversation and this time we will give the floor to two experts who will give their comments on the presentation as well as their insights on how we can create a, um, a, a conducive regulatory environment for modern biotechnology innovation and adoption in the Philippines and uh, how we can um, enhance the country's capacity for modern biotechnology research and development. So our, our first discussion, our first discussant is uh, no other than the director of the Bureau of Agriculture and Fisheries uh, Standards, uh, Director Vivencio Mamaril. Director Mamaril obtained his bachelor's degree, Master of Science and PhD from uh, the Gregorio Araneta University uh, Foundation. And he has been in the government service since 1982. Prior to his current post, he served as the director of the Department of Agriculture's Biotechnology Program Office, Bureau of Plant Industry, and Bureau, Bureau of Agricultural Research. Director Mamaril, sir, the floor is now yours. Hello, Sheila, and everyone. Good afternoon. Magandang hapon po. Okay, let me just, uh, I, um, am I audible? Naririnig po ba ako? Yes, sir. Okay, so I made some <clears throat> Some notes no, on your present on the two presentations. Okay, so we know for uh, number one, we know that the biotech science is moving so fast. Uh, you also mentioned about blood breeding innovations. <clears throat> so before we're only talking about genetically modified crops, genetically modified organisms, genetic engineering. Now we have gene technology. So this is a coming some technology, and that is why regulations would be more challenged. And there's one question there kanina, no, about uh, products of um, gene editing. Sige, sagutin na lang natin yung tanong mamaya, no, when you take a look at it. So, gene editing, we're talking of um, cutting tools, genetic scissors, kung tawagin. So, yan yung mga at present technology sa pinagahandaan that the Department of Agriculture also is trying to be prepared, no, on matters of regulations. <clears throat> Now, let's take a look at the biotechnology in the Philippines on matters of what crops are being planted in the Philippines now. So, number one, we only have uh, corn that is uh, that is planted in the Philippines. So, we have only GM corn. Uh, there are three types. Number one, the BT corn or insect resistance. Number two is uh, herbicide tolerance. And number three is a <clears throat> both. So, they call it traits, you know. So number one, either the corn is insect resistant. Number two, um, it is herbicide tolerance. Or number three, they have both. Uh, what was introduced first was the insect resistance. Second was herbicide tolerance. And the third was the, the stack trait or the combined. On matters of adoption, um, both were, I mean, all were adopted. All were adopted. 
but farmers, when they learned of, when there was already the herbicide tolerance, so the adoption rate of herbicide tolerance was higher than the insect resistance. Um, this means that farmers are more interested uh, in corn, uh, on matters of herbicide tolerance because there is a big labor cost on weed management. But when there is already this stacked one, so stock now has a higher, so in terms of ranking, so in terms of adoption, we have mo uh, mostly planted would be the stock, uh, second by herbicide tolerance, and third would be BT core. But I don't have the data, but definitely that in terms of adoption, uh, that would be the ranking. Now, uh, the golden rice has been approved under the JDC 2016. So approved for propagation, meaning to say it could be now uh, commercially planted and available uh, to farmers, the seeds. So we're talking of the seeds. I am not very privy, nor I am privy of the business plan of field rice related to commercial propagation now of golden rice. So at first there will be a seed production. Then that would be, and the next is, it's in the, it's a, it's a call of field rice. But they are already allowed under our regulations. Um, we are we are number one. In, I mean, among Asian countries, we are number one in terms of um, using GM crops because we are. Uh, I think we have more than fifty thousand hectares no, planted to GM corn. Um, how long has this been in the country? Uh, since two thousand and two, it was in December of two thousand and two when. The MON 1810 was approved. BPI approved it, and it was 2002, it's so 2022. So, nearing two decades now. So, by December of 2022, the first VT corn would be celebrating its uh, 20th year. And within these 20 years, we have not received any, or no one has ever submitted any harmful data. I mean to say, uh, data that will tell that the GM corn uh, is hazardous or has, has caused more harm than, than the other types of corn. Um, let's talk of the new JDC uh, of 2021. Uh, under JDC 2021, uh, the first application we received was the PT eggplant. So this will be the first baby, the first victim, or the first application that will be processed under JDC 2021. Okay, so this one, personally, my take on the BT eggplant is, um, if ever it gets approval, what's next? Um, because we know that researchers or scientists are good in production of technology, but on matters of business, I think the academe or researchers or, not, or scientists, hindi yan ang kanilang cup of tea. So, this is something nice to see, no? Uh, if ever it gets approved. Um, and next, um, admittedly, now, when, when we, the presentation presented um, the challenges, or what happened in JDC 2021 was that the, the process of application, uh, the process of finishing a reg, um, an application even became longer no, than the previous one, the AO number eight. When, it, when the JDC one of 2016 was enforced, we even have applications reaching 800 calendar days. So, para ha, umabot ng dalawang taon bago matapos. Ah, shocking as it is, but that is the truth. Kaya yung nakalagay yung word na bureaucratic inefficiencies. Ah, harsh siya, but guilty as charged. Because you, you cannot deny that I saw it, you know. Um, every time kasi na the DA Biosafety Committee, because under the JDC1, the DA Biosafety Committee, is the last station of the cross. 
of the application and we will trace how many days it took that application to reach the JDC. I mean, to reach the ABC. So you would see two hand, three figures, no? Uh, below, parang 99 and below is something rare among all those applications that you showed under the JDC 2016. Um, I will always say the guilty as charged, no? That, the, that at the last station, there are those that reach more than uh, two years. And okay, so, but one thing good in JDC 2021 is the non-renewals. So you only, you are only given one certificate and that stays forever. Unless revoked otherwise. And um, I think that's all I wanted to say, but in matters of, will, will, will the JDC 2021 be able to meet the decided number of regulation days? Okay, guilty as charged again. Because um, we have already breached the 10 day period, the 10 day regulatory, the, the, the 10 day re prescribed regulatory days that you are to finish an application. So, ladies and gentlemen, guilty as charged. The truth is, on Monday, so on latest Chica from Marites, uh, on Monday, the DA Biosafety Committee will assess, we'll have the first meeting of the assessment for the BT eggplant. But take note that under this um, JDC 2021, before, um, there is already what we call as simultaneous assessments, no? So I do not, I am not privy whether DA, DOH Value Safety Committee has convened its meeting. I am not also privy to the information if the DNR, DENR Value Safety Committee has already convened its meeting. The DOH, I am not also privy when are they, uh, if already they have uh, met related to BT eggplant. But one thing I can assure the public now is uh, the DA by City Committee will meet on April 25, 8.30 in the morning, right up, right after everyone's flag ceremony. Um, we will now discuss the application for BT Egg Plan for propagation under JDC 2021. I think that's all I wanted to give. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Director Mamadil, for your insightful and candid, candid remarks. And thank you for giving us an update on uh, um, on uh, the uh, propagation for uh, BT eggplant. And salamat po sa update, sir. And we will hear more from Director Mamadil uh, during the open forum. Okay, so friends, at this point, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our next discussant, Dr. Euphemio T. Rasco. He is an academician at the National Academy of Science and Technology, or uh, NAS. Dr. Uh, Rasco has led institutions and projects in a wide range of research and development activities covering plant breeding, uh, variety evaluation, crop uh, physiology, and environmental and agronomic studies. He led and worked in the academe, uh, particularly with the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and UP Mindanao, the private sector, with uh, the East West Seed Company, and uh, the government um, as part of the Philippine uh, Rice Research uh, Institute of Phil Rice and international agricultural research is institutions such as the International Potato Center. His pioneering and notable works involve tropical vegetable hybrids, potatoes with potato and neglected species such as sago palm and nipa palm, among others. Upon his retirement from the academe, he, sh he uh, shifted his focus to studying connections between agriculture, nutrition, and environment. He has published about 100 journal articles and five books as main author or co-author and among those books include the unfolding gene revolution published by uh the simio circa or simio southeast asian regional center for graduate study and research in agriculture and the international service for the acquisition of agribiotech applications uh that book was published in 2008 and he also published uh 
another book called Regulation of Modern Plant Biotechnology in the Philippines, published by NAS in 2021. Friends, I now give you Dr. Eufemio Rasco. Sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations to the authors of the paper and also to uh, Dr. Mamaril for the very enlightening uh, discussion. I did not hesitate to accept the invitation to uh, serve in this panel as the topic is uh, very close to my heart. In the first place, I'm a trained uh, in methods. Biotechnology is an important tool in plant breeding. Can I have the next slide? Secondly, I wrote a similar document, as Sheila pointed out, that was 13 years ago. This was published as a mini book by the National Academy of Science and Technology. And uh, uh, the topic was also covered in the book 13 years ago. The title of the book is The Unfolding Gene Revolution, Ideology, Science, and Regulation of Plant Biotechnology. It was published in 2008 by CIRCA and ISAA. The di digital version of The Unfolding Gene Revolution is available free at uh, nas.ph in PDF format. And uh, both books are also published by uh, Amazon Kindle. I encourage the participants of this webinar to look at these publications. This brings me to the first of three major points. The paper is essentially a call for action by local policymakers to pave the way for the use of modern biotechnology as a tool for national development. For this action to happen, policymakers need to be aware, interested, and properly informed on the subject. My experience tells me that this may sound simple, but it is made uh, difficult by the following factors. Can I have the next slide? First is the uh, persistent misinformation and negative views being peddled by a determined and well-funded international lobby. My risk communication lesson tells me that it takes four repetitions of a true positive message to correct one false negative message. Second, other issues, some of which are equally important to policymakers that compete for the that compete for their attention. Regrettably, the only time some policymakers get interested is when they are alerted by controversies manufactured by the anti-biotech lobby. In this case, the only policy they consider is how to slow down or altogether stop the introduction of useful products or biotechnology. Number three, policy makers today may not be the same people who were already aware and interested in biotechnology yesterday. The paper made the correct observation that there has been a rapid turnover of people in this category either because they do not occupy regular civil service positions or because they are politicians who get elected out of office. What all this suggests is that messaging should be persistent. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I've been doing a messaging similar to the topic today for almost, almost one quarter of a century, that's 25 years, as a personal crusade with much to be desired by way of action by our policymakers. Thus, the first point I like to make is for the authors of this paper to commit themselves to a long-term crusade, maybe 25 years, 50 years, focusing on the policy gaps that remain. Begin by publishing the paper and repeating the message again and again and again. I would like to be able to ask the authors 25 years from now if their paper had any impact on government policy. But hopefully this publicity campaign will not be done 
before one potentially self-defeating recommendation of the paper is, is restudied. I refer specifically to the statement, quote, appropriate product labeling is also necessary to address consumption hesitancy, promote transparency under a sensitive and competitive environment, unquote. By way of the second of three points in my discussion, I propose the following guide for consideration in studies on labeling. Next slide, please. Any form of labeling should avoid using the terms used by the anti-GMO lobby. The term GMO, for example, is commonly used in popular discourse. It has become an emotionally laden term that does nothing to inform the consumer about the utility or safety of the product. Second, be sure what the label and its purpose should be. For example, there are two possibilities for Eggman. First, the label contains Cry1AC protein. This is for uh, uh, the BT type of Eggman. And second, does not contain Cry1AC protein for non-BT Eggman. This theoretical label may be used for eggplant fruit that is sold in the market. The Cry1AC protein is what meaningfully distinguishes BT from non-BT eggplant. It may be accurate and informative, unlike the term GMO. Either way, we have a problem. The label can confuse consumers. Cry1AC protein is a nutrient to humans, but a poison to the fruit and shoot borer, the insect pest of eggplant. Will it be perceived as a positive information or a negative one? I say neither. In the first place, the concentration in the eggplant fruit is so small, about 30 microgram per gram dry weight of fruit, to make a difference to humans. Secondly, it is digested into component amino acids in the human gut. Thus, its activity as poison is immediately disposed of, assuming that the eggplant is eaten raw. If it is cooked, say goodbye to Cry1AC protein. It will be destroyed by heat before it is even consumed. Thirdly, even if it is eaten raw and survives digestion, there are no receptors in the human gut that may trigger the toxicity of the cry protein. In short, mm -hmm. the term contains cry1ac protein in a BT eggplant label is not useful for all practical purposes. Although it is a good alternative to the even more useless term GMO. GMO may refer to any of thousands of products of modern biotechnology each of which presents unique potential benefits and risk. On the other hand, the label does not contain Cry1AC protein is not a guarantee that an ordinary eggplant does not contain this protein. Bacillus thuringiensis, the bacterium that produces this protein in nature, is commonly found naturally occurring in soils. There is always the possibility that the ordinary eggplant contains Cry1AC protein, not from biotechnology, but from the soil-borne bacterium. In short, the label does not contain Cry1AC protein, may only be accurate if every non-BT eggplant sold in the market is analyzed for the presence of Cry1AC protein. In conclusion, theoretically at least, both BT eggplant and ordinary eggplant may contain Cry1AC protein. This example shows that labels can be confusing or completely useless to the consumer. It may be better not to have labels. Third point, any labeling legislation must be enforced. What will it uh, uh, entail? It means detecting the presence of DNA or protein that is associated, associated with modern biotechnology. 
This will require a network of laboratories, very much like the network we have for COVID, trained laboratory personnel, enforcers who will regularly collect samples for testing, prosecutors and judges who will process violations. We also need jail space for those who will be found guilty of violations, assuming the crime will call for jail sentences. In short, we need an entire set of bureaucrats and physical facilities to enforce the modern biotechnology labeling law. Can we justify spending this for enforcing a useless label? Proponents of GMO labeling generally have only one purpose in mind. It is to scare consumers, not to educate them. Should society pay to be scared? The last of three points I like to make is that I wish the paper examined the fundamental assumption behind the existing practices in regulation of modern biotechnology. The fundamental assumption is that modern biotechnology is inherently risky. Next slide, please. Without this assumption, the entire regulatory process dedicated to products of modern biotechnology cannot be justified. Products of modern biotechnology can be regulated under existing laws and practices that regulate introduction of food products. Under existing laws, the safety of food products is determined by looking at the product itself, not the process by which they were created. For new varieties of plants, for example, the regulatory system does not discriminate whether it was produced using conventional breeding, mutation breeding using chemicals or irradiation, or through its interspecific crosses. If there is a known risk of a toxin or allergen, the regulatory process requires toxicity or allergenicity studies. The basic assumption that uh, modern biotechnology is inherently risky is a product of ignorance of the scientific community in the 1980s when this technology was new and poorly understood. In fairness, it was the scientific, scientific community itself that made this wrong assumption. But unfortunately, this assumption, this wrong assumption, was enshrined in the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, of which the Philippines is a signatory, deliberations of which took place in the 1990s. The Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, on the other hand, became the template for all the Philippine regulations. Since the Cartagena Protocol, we have learned a lot more about modern biotechnology. This is backed by almost 50 years of research. The reason why modern biotechnology has, was thought to be inherently risky in the 1980s is that the process is new and can cause unintended, presumably harmful consequences resulting from the disruption of genomes through the introduction of novel DNA sequences. Mainstream science no longer subscribes to this view for many reasons that have been elucidated by more recent knowledge. Among them are, next slide please. First, transfer of DNA across taxonomic barriers is not new. It has been going on probably for millions of years. And uh, as uh, evidence perhaps, the human genome has traces of bacterial, plant, and viral DNA. So if somebody calls you a virus, he may be partially correct. Second, transfer of DNA may have negative consequences. But this is eliminated by natural and artificial selection. Its positive role is that it is an engine of 
evolution. Without evolution, there will be no humans to debate about the transfer of DNA across taxonomic barriers today. Number three, genomes are so adaptable that they tolerate biological, physical, and chemical processes, abuses that tend to disrupt their structure. And number four, the risk to the environment and human health associated with disruptions such as introduction of foreign DNA is not any higher using modern biotechnology compared to conventional plant feeding methods. I think this is the most important, so I'd like to repeat it. The risk to the environment and human health associated with disruptions such as introduction of foreign DNA is not any higher using modern biotechnology compared to conventional plant breeding methods. We also learned that more than 25 years of farming experience over billions of hectares and consumption by billions of consumers show the relative safety of modern biotechnology. For the above reasons, a science-based regulatory regime for products of modern biotechnology must be product-based, not process-based. There is no reason why products of modern biotechnology should be treated differently from other products of plant breeding. Risk assessment must be flexible, depending on objective conditions such as, next slide please. First, the gene being used and the donor organism. Second, the host organism and the way it will be used. And lastly, the environment under which the host organism will be grown. It is no longer reasonable for regulation to treat all pro products of modern biotechnology the same way. That is, all of them are considered inherently risky or more risky than other methods of uh, genetic modification or plant breeding. Risk assessment must be done on a case-to-case -case basis and it should be applied to all products of genetic modification, regardless of whether it is modern biotechnology or conventional breed. For this reason, I personally campaign for repudiation, not merely modification of the special regulatory regime for products of modern biotechnology. As the authors of the paper just presented their review, the regulations are burdensome not only to the researchers, but also to the government bureaucracy, which has to harness the services of seven departments, national government departments, to implement the regulations. By comparison, we do not deploy this much intellectual resource for food security. I say these regulations are not necessary. In my book, I referred to these regulations as rules that invite violation. I therefore propose to revise the burdensome statement in the present paper to, re to read, it is unnecessarily burdensome. I also urge the authors to call for withdrawal of support, support for the Cartagena Protocol, which is the basis for Philippine regulation of modern biotechnology for the simple reason that it is based on outdated scientific assumption. It is my hope that the authors of the paper will integrate these suggestions in their recommendations. Lastly, the Coalition for uh, Modernization of Agriculture in the Philippines, or CAMP, drafted a bill creating a biotechnology authority this was done in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture and this seeks to institutionalize support for biotechnology. If we imagine the present regulations as brakes of a biotech car, the proposed bill will provide the accelerator and the steering wheel. After all, we will not be going anywhere in a car with only the brakes in it. I hope that the authors will buy the biotech car that the camp organization wishes to sell. Thank you and good afternoon.
And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Rasko, for your uh, thought-provoking um, comments, sir. So we will hear more from Dr. Rasko during the open forum. So at this point, before we go to the next um, section or next part of our uh, webinar, may I give the floor back to our uh, presenter, particularly to our, our main presenter, Dr. Sano Domingo. Sonny, you may want to respond to some of the uh, points raised by our uh, discussants, particularly from um, um, the uh, points raised by uh, Dr. Arasco, such as those uh, pertaining to uh, uh, labeling, which was part of your, I think, part of your recommendations. He uh, mentioned about the pros and cons of, uh, you know, labeling and um, what particularly when it is uh if in case it's going to be implemented and he also mentioned other other important points uh which you, you may want to react on sunny please all right uh thank you sheila and thank you to dr mamaril and dr rasco for those very very nice insights now and comments on our on our work uh i'll start with dr mamaril so he mentioned that well, number one, we are highest in terms of GM uh, crop adoption in Southeast Asia. Uh, probably what's close to us is, is nearly China. China is, is uh, a lot higher in terms of uh, GM crop adoption in the region, but uh, we are not comparable to, to China in terms of what they have there commodity-wise. Uh, uh, he mentioned as well affirmation in terms of bureaucratic inefficiency. And we've We've seen that not only in terms of the timelines involved in uh, the different uh, GM commodities going through the regulatory processes that we have. We've also heard anecdotal uh, evidences from our interviews and uh, FGTs on this. Um, I think what's worth highlighting is, for example, we are evolving in the right direction because comparing BT eggplant with that, with that of GM rice, for example, golden rice, uh, BT eggplant has gone through a very um, interesting journey uh, from the um, well, the early 2000s to what they have now, which is still uh, them trying to get that commercial propagation approval. But uh, Golden Rice, actually, when I was looking at the timeline, they had their approval for the field trial, for the food feed and processing almost in the same year in 2019. And then eventually in 2021, they had the approval for commercial propagation. That's that's a very small window for consecutive approvals, no, going through our processes. So that's, I think, uh, efficiency uh, in terms of timeline. And probably we have to uh, emulate the process that we have uh, for GM, uh, for GM rice, no? and probably correct some of the inefficiencies that we have seen in the other processes. JC, uh, JDC 2021, I think, is um, very good in terms of what's offering uh, efficiency-wise within the structure and within the process. But uh, as also Dr. Mamarin mentioned, uh, we have yet to see whether uh, we'll be seeing good no, in terms of actual manifested uh, augmentations in processes. Uh, since the, the current delay already no, in terms of BT Eggplant's application. For Dr. Rasko, uh, he mentioned about commitment on the, on the advocacy. I think uh, for us working within the bureaucracy, within the government, and us particularly uh, within the institution that is PIDS, I think the commitment is for us to look at objectivity and efficiency within the structure. So. Modern biotechnology is very polarizing. Uh, we've seen this in our conversations with so many groups, but uh, I think what's unifying is for us to look at uh, what's good, not only in, um, in the eventual product going through the process, but also in terms of the exchanges among the different groups. So objectivity, I think is, is uh, the key word in terms of our commitment, five, 10, to 20 years uh, down the line. Labeling, very important because essentially our consumers need to be informed uh, in terms of what they are putting in uh, to their bodies. So that's a very basic right for individuals. They have to decide 
uh, what kind of commodity, which foods that they would uh, consume for their own uh, physical benefit. So labeling, I guess, is very important in terms of that very informed decision making individually. Dr. Rasko also mentioned that uh, modern biotechnology is inherently risky. He also mentioned uh, close to the end that the risk to the environment and human health from foreign uh, DNA uh, from modern biotechnology is uh, basically comparable to that of the risk with traditional plant breeding. So this has to be conveyed, I guess, to, to the other uh, interest groups that we have looking at modern biotechnology. And this is a very good message going forward and has to be a key message in all our IEC campaigns, no, I guess. Um, when we were talking to the NAT Pro uh, MB group, um, they highlighted, for example, the need to have that platform for exchanges, for stakeholder participation. And I guess that has to be enhanced in what we have because JDC 2021 actually further lessened uh, that window for consultation. So it may be uh, an opening for compromise. I don't know, uh, depending on uh, our bureaucracy, on our people within the system, whether they are amenable to something like this. But in the end, we have to look at the longer term um, target, which is to have proper legislation on modern biotechnology. Um, maybe later on, you'll be asking that because I, I'm seeing uh, written questions in the chat box. So uh, I think that's it for, for now, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you to um, uh, Sunny. So friends, this time we, will, we would like to hear from you, uh, but uh, let's take a short break to give our uh, speakers um, uh, some time, you know, to um, gather themselves before they start asking questions. So let us have a, um, a poll, no? So, and this poll is open to our WebEx participants and our viewers on Facebook. Um, during the course of our discussion, uh, there have been, um, uh, there was a, a presentation and also reactions from our speakers regarding um, some of the constraints that, that uh, impair or derail the uh, development of, and uptake of modern biotech products. And um, this time we would like to know your views on, uh, on the question, Okay, the question is now on our screen and it's, okay, let me read the question. In your view, what is the most serious constraint to the development and uptake of modern biotech products? Is it A, stringent regulatory processes, B, regulatory delays uh, due to bureaucratic uh, inefficiencies, or C, high cost of technology investment in R&D, or D, intellectual property issues, or E, negative public perception of genetically modified crops. So you may enter your answer now as we will close the poll in uh, five seconds. So this is an opinion poll. So there is no right or wrong answer. We just want to know your view. So just pick the item that you think is the most serious constraint. Okay. So when... Um, Okay, the poll has ended. So friends, um, we will look at the results later. I will uh, give, give you the results later. So at this point, I invite our presenters and discussants to the open forum, and our speakers will also be joined by Ms. Karen Penaso of the Department of Agriculture's uh, Biotech Program. Okay, so let us now um, read uh, the questions and I, May I direct this uh, first question to uh, Ms. Penaso? Um, okay, there's a question here on uh, updates on the draft memorandum circular on uh, plant breeding innovations or new plant breeding techniques. So I think uh, you're very much private with this, Ms. Penaso. I now give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Sheila. Okay, so actually I'm here to provide updates on 
the uh, proposed memorandum circular on plant breeding innovation. So first, on behalf of the Department of Agriculture Biotech Program Office, I would like to thank the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for the opportunity to share with you an update on the rules and procedure for the evaluation and formal determination of the products of plant breeding innovations or new breeding techniques. So to give you a brief background, the DA Biotech Program commissioned a study in 2018 to review the state-of-the-art regulatory landscape and applicable domestic laws, rules, and regulations for PBI products. And these policy recommendations in, uh, in this study were submitted to the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines in 2019. In 2020, resolution number one was issued by, by the NCBP classifying PBI products as GMOs if they contain novel genetic material obtained from the application of modern biotechnology tools. So such PBI products will have to undergo biosafety evaluation pursuant to the Joint Department Circular 1 uh, series of 2021. And accordingly, the Department of Agriculture created a technical advisory group on modern biotechnology and related innovations for agriculture and fisheries or TAG MBI to craft the guidelines for the evaluation and determination of PBI products. So such memorandum circular mandates the Bureau of Plant Industry to serve as the entry point of all submissions for the technical consultation for evaluation and determination or TCED process, which is a technical evaluation process to determine the regulatory status of the PBI product under the JDC1 a series of 2021. So um, the determination process from the submission up to the uh, official determination of the regulatory status of the PBI product shall take approximately 22 to 32 working days from the receipt of the submission provided that it is sufficient in both form and substance. And currently, uh, the DA Memorandum Circular Number 8, uh, it was signed by Secretary uh, William Dar on March 21, 2022, and will take effect after the completion of the publication for general circulation. And we are targeting to, um, to have it published on or before May 2, 2002, as we are still completing the procur procurement process for the publication service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. So, may I? Uh, okay, we have a question from Ms. Loida uh, Paris of Phil Rice. He he wants to know if uh, crops developed through gene editing will also go through the stringent biosafety regulations like GM GM crops. So, okay, may I um, direct this question to Director Choi? <coughs> hello, hello, Ms. Loida. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, okay, so there were some details no, related to plant breeding innovations. Yes. A while ago from Karen. Karen Yabashicha. Yeah, from Karen. I think it will not be, uh, will not be as, as stringent as the GM uh, regulations. I remember uh, the, the statement of Dr. Rasko a while ago that we'll try, uh, this time we'll be on a, on process, I mean rather on product assessment, not the process anymore. So Dr. Rasko, um, it may be a good news to you that uh, if ever the, um, those that will be applied uh, for under the gene editing or whatever, or under plant breeding innovations, it would be more of a product regulation rather than process. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Director Choi. Um, yeah. Dr. Rasko, would you like to uh, provide your input to the discussion, sir? Well, I support the uh, position of the answer of uh, Director Choi. Maganda nga kung ano, uh, product in the process based. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rasko. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, and um, 
Sunny, this one is from uh, Peter Turingan of the Senate Economic Planning Office. Could you elaborate on the proposed legislation that was that you mentioned? So broadly speaking, what would ideally be contained in this proposed legislation? Okay, uh, thank you, Sheila. Well, from our exchanges with the different stakeholders, it's really us augmenting institutions within government. Right now, we have a very stringent set of uh, regulations on modern biotechnology and really the inefficiencies within the bureaucracy. So as mentioned earlier, uh, you have so many departments looking into uh, biosafety as well as uh, the potential health risk no, to eventual consumers. So it's, it's really us uh, possibly coming up with um, a more rational uh, structure for regulating modern biotechnology. I've read a draft before uh, of a proposed bill on, on modern biotechnology, and it's really about us coming up with a central agency and us eventually linking with the private sector in terms of uh, consummation in operation. So it's it's institution within the bureaucracy linking with our stakeholders eventually. Right now, we have augmented centers for biotechnology. And as I've heard also from our partners in government, we have the centers, but we don't have the organic uh, structure to support such, as well as uh, possible fund augmentation, resource augmentation for their operations. So um, plantilla positions, human resource uh, investment, capital investment, possibly uh, leading to uh, higher degrees for our people dealing with both research as well as regulatory functions. Because right now we have just designated individuals looking at the different processes mm -hmm. uh, within the um, regulatory levels. And that's not good because uh, people move around, people get um, pirated. And so what you are left with are almost starting from scratch in so many cases. So you have to invest on individuals that will stay within the bureaucracy and will make the process even better as you go forward into the future. So institution, I think, will be the, the major flavor of an eventual legislation on modern biotechnology, institutional mm -hmm. augmentation. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Sonny. And uh, Dr. Choi, um, I agree with you on that point uh, to have um, more regular, more rational, regulations of GM crops. Um, Sonny, you mentioned that um, you mentioned about uh, you have had conversations with stakeholders, no? And uh, we all know that one of the most important stakeholders in agriculture are the farmers themselves, our local gro growers. Um, how receptive are our local growers or our local farmers to uh, planting, uh, uh, let's say, GM, GM crops? Uh, would you have any what has been um, um, verbalized during your conversations with them? And I can also ask this question to Dr. Choi. Yeah. So the polls from uh, farmer groups, no? Mm -hmm. What I can say is, is from my previous uh, engagements with farmer groups, no? Um, not only last year when we were looking at modern biotechnology. From those conversations, we have polarizing uh, interests, not only within uh, CSOs, such uh, polarized uh, views are also present within farmer groups. So there are those who are somehow uh, not interested or repulsed by the idea of them planting or adopting modern biotechnology products or crops. No? But there are those that are very open in terms of them adopting uh, mm -hmm. such uh, commodities going through our a vetting process. And that's very evident, for example, in corn farmers from the zone Visayas and Mindanao. For BT eggplant, this is something new because corn essentially is being used as as ingredient for feeds. But uh, BT eggplant, this is uh, a different commodity because this is for human consumption. And probably that is why it has traveled a, a more uh, controversial path you know, in terms of uh, it being uh, vetted in the laboratory and it now undergoing uh, vetting for commercial propagation. So, iba talaga kung pagkain yung pinag-uusapan. 
Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, in our recent exchange with um, a polarized group, no, when it comes to modern biotechnology, um, this is the concern that they have uh, given us. And they have highlighted the need for that uh, platform wherein they can also contribute to no? the eventual vetting process and approval process. Mm -hmm. Parang ngayon kasi wala yung window for them to actually influence the eventual approval of a certain GM crop. So parang yun ang gusto nila. They want to have that bigger role. Mm -hmm. But for farmers, yeah, there are pro and there are those that have been dissuaded to actually look into modern biotechnology. But I guess proper IEC campaign, no? Mm -hmm. Proper education among them will mm -hmm. possibly convince them to to vote otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and having a that uh, platform where they can also air their views, no? Yes. Um, yes. Director Choi, I saw you nodding your head, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, a second emotion na lang. <laughs> Pero sabi ka, to see is to believe. Um, let us, I'm excited, no? If ever eggplant will be given authority or permit for propagation because in certain fora where bt eggplant is being presented farmers are tickled no? so oh, nga, no? uh, blah, blah, parang they seem to be interested with the technology but at that but let us wait that is why um it must interested to malama na sa business plan ng uplb now, let us say, if it gets approved, kaya, who will produce the seeds? Uh, will they have the economy of scale? Mm -hmm. Or if some a private company will go through it, uh, dadaanan niya rin ba yung pinagdaanan ng sita papaya before it, kaya, it became a, I mean, a commodity that a private company is producing the seeds. So, tingnan natin yung business plan. That's very challenging actually, eh. Thank you. Thank you, the, uh, Director Choi. Uh, let me read um, a, um, a comment, uh, an input uh, from uh, Dr. Violi Villegas, which she shared with us uh, through the chat box. The revised JDC 2021 has a provision which says that plant and plant products that do not contain novel combinations are not covered. Specifically, such provision is on page 3 of the JDC Article 1, Section 1. Salamat po, uh, Dr. Villegas. Okay, uh, let's go to other questions. And this time uh, we have um, some, um, okay, a comment from Dr. Will Briones of, uh, of PIDS. Uh, well, uh, first of all, he, uh, he want, um, he's requesting our authors to check the units used in, uh, I think, in, in, uh, in the table. Uh, Probably he's referring to the sensitivity analysis. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ruel. Also, he said uh, he is shocked to see that the regulatory cost is almost as big as research cost. And his question is, is there some way to streamline regulatory regime so as not to misallocate resources? Uh, may we have your thoughts on this? Um, Director Choi, would you like to take a crack on this question first? Then I'll go yeah. to uh, Dr. Rasko <laughs> and then to uh, Sonny. Go ahead, yes. sir. Sir Briones, uh, take note that there were three um, three issuances related to regulations. No, AO number eight in 2002, then JDC in 20, JDC one in 2016. Um, when JDC 2016 was enforced, we were looking to an environment that the regulation, that the number of regulatory days will be shortened. Apparently, it did not happen. Kaya nga sabi ko, guilty as charged. Now, let's take a look at uh, JDC 2021. Hopefully, it will not suffer the same just like uh, the JDC 2016. I really promise as one of the, at the moment, I'm the chair of the DA Biosafety Committee. And I really promise that uh, we will be at our best, no? That we will be able to shorten the number of regulation days. To comply with it, this is still a challenge for us because we, at the moment, we have an, a manual type of application. Mm, we have not yet automated this. That is why on streamlining it, on Monday, I am going to 
the Monday after. Monday morning, I'll have a meeting uh, for the BTA plant. In the afternoon, I'm going to have a meeting with the um, ICTS or the, the group of programmers of the Department of Agriculture. We would like to have an online, I mean, we have a, an online and um, an online automated application and tracker that let us say Sheila is an applicant. She would know day by day what's happening. So, para kalo ko border sa Shopee, alam mo kung nasaan siya, saan siya nagtatagal. Uh, we wanted to have something like that. Um, para alam namin kung ipapako na ba kami sa cruise o hindi pa. Thank you. But we really intend, no? Uh, the number, kasi yung 10 days, uh, na-stress ako last week, yun ang totoo, nung matagal ko yung application, na manual. My God. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Choi. Uh, Dr. Rasko, uh, would you would you like to add to the conversation, sir, and how we could uh, streamline the reg regulatory regime? Uh, yes, the uh, I, I agree that the use of ICT technology will uh, uh, streamline it in the sense that uh, the stakeholders are properly informed about the status and the uh, regulators are alerted that uh, yes. uh, if they're sitting on some uh, um, proposal that the public will know. So th this is uh, a pressure on our regulators to act faster on, on, on the uh, proposals of developers of these products. Back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rasko. Okay, let's move to another question, and this time is from Narceo Bahet. Okay. Okay. Uh, those GMO traits mentioned by the speakers are against insects and weeds. The GMO traits are essentially selection pressures, and so his question is, has there been monitoring for the same insect species and weeds? Uh huh. Who would like to, uh, yeah. Dr. Mamaril, go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, one of the requirements here is for the post approval, no? in the post approval of a, we call it transformation event, let us say for insect resistance event, the, the plant quarantine or the Bureau of Plant Industry for this matter, and also would, I mean, the BPI and also the, the technology developer are through its product stewardship would uh, monitor areas where the GM crops are grown in terms of insect population and in terms of weed population uh, uh, before planting, after planting on these crops. And these are the data that we review when I say we review whenever the whenever the event is applied for renewal under JDC 2016. So the data could be the data are in the Europe plant in the sea. Dr. Nars Bahet, they are there. And there is an insect resistance management team and weed resistance management team composed of scientists and they are mostly from UPLB that would review no, this, this data and they issue a certain certificate that there were no changes in the environment related to insect population or weed population. Uh, if you wanted to take a look at this data, perhaps uh, NARS, you can request them from the Bureau of Plant Industry. They are the, the owner of the, I mean, they have it as a regulatory data in their office. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Director Mamaril, uh, we have um, more questions from our participants. Uh, okay, this one is from Mr. Vicente Camillon. Uh, what is the possibility of regulatory capture in the biotechnology industry? Um, okay, Sunny, would you like to um, give your insights on this question first and I, I can call the other speakers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably it can be related to 
the effectiveness and efficiency of the bureaucracy. Because mm -hmm. it's a question of whether you are looking at the interest of the regulator or the interest of the, the public in general. And in the case where you have inefficiencies no, in the process, as well as the people uh, working within the processes, then that may be a valid question, no? uh, that regulatory capture. But uh, as we go forward and as we augment what we have process-wise, policy-wise, I think we are less and less uh, prone to having such. Thank you, Zila. Thank you very much. Director Choi, um, would you like to share your thoughts on this question? Uh, sorry, ha. Hindi ko may dinner masyadi regulatory capture. Ano, sorry, ha. Uh, ano ibig sabihin nun? Wala kang kawala, ganun, pag gumawa ka ng GM product. I really don't know. Sunny, ano Sunny would you like to, um, um, because this is a, Pasensya na, hindi ko mag-grasp. Ano ba ibig sabihin niya ng regulatory capture? Mm -hmm. Parang it's a question as to uh, the interest of what the regulators regulate compared to the interest of the, the public or the stakeholders involved. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. it's uh, an interplay between those interests. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <clears throat> That's why in the regulatory process, no, we are always saying that we do this because we wanted to protect the public of the of any product or GM product that would be introduced would be as what Dr. Raskin say would uh, would give more harm than its conventional part that than its conventional counterpart. That's why the rest the reason says that people say oh they are equal. So what is it? So at the end we say what else is new? So if there is nothing new, then it gets approval because that is what we wanted. That's why we do risk assessment. Eh? Are you as safe as if your counterpart? Then if, they, if you are there, then that is it. You get approval. I mean, you get a biosafety approval. Thank you. Sana tamay na ko. <laughs> Thank you for your thoughts. And I, I saw uh, Dr. Uh, Rasko. Uh, sir, would you like to uh, uh, provide your input to this question, sir? Well, yes. Uh, well, regulation is uh, a very difficult job, so I don't uh, sympathize with the. Uh, well, I, I sympathize with the regulators who uh, need to balance the need to assure the uh, safety and utility mm -hmm. of uh, certain products and uh, the need uh, of the farmers to mm -hmm. use them as quickly as uh, possible so that uh, uh, they can avoid the uh, regulatory cost or cost of delays. Uh, so in my view, uh, in, in order to, to uh, reduce the chance of uh, you know, uh, regulatory capture, uh, Sana maging kwan, uh, more transparent yung uh, mm -hmm. regulatory process. Uh, but uh, most importantly, uh, it should be based on science-based uh, principles. That's why I've been advocating na uh, dapat ang maging basis ng regulation natin is science-based. Uh, because it's only true uh, using this objective basis that we can be assured that uh, subjective subjective decisions will be minimized and that is what regulatory capture is about uh, you are favoring one over the other uh, because uh, you have certain biases and these biases arise because mm -hmm. your decisions are not based on scientific uh, mm -hmm. information Mm -hmm. That's why in my own presentation, I emphasize the value of uh, relying more on scientific guidance more than anything mm -hmm. else. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Rasko. Um, indeed, uh, well, negative public perception is usually fueled by, you know, uh, misinformation. And so, um, and, and I think uh, this was um, emphasized by Sani in, in their recommendations, so more information dissemination. And you also mentioned this, sir, no? 
in in your presentation, Dr. Rasko, that there really has to be, you know, um, um, a strong fight against uh, misinformation and disinformation. There has been a lot of noise, um, you know, created by, uh, you know, international groups. No, how strong are they? How how strong are they when it comes to, you know, um, their influence? How 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 strong are they? And how can we, well, it was mentioned here, it should all, always be science-based, but how can we intensify science education so that, uh, you know, everything, uh, decision-making should be based on science? Dr. Rasko? Well, in my book, I made several recommendations, one of which is to uh, integrate the uh, knowledge about biotechnology, uh, its uh, advantages, disadvantages, as well as the uh, uh, theoretical uh, basis uh, at all levels of uh, education. Siyempre, hindi naman siguro sa elementary magtuturo ka na ng chemistry and DNA, no? <laughs> but, uh, it has to be graduated. Uh, mm -hmm. But a, a good starting point might be at the college level. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, one of my advocacies uh, years ago uh, was to uh, uh, have a general education course in, in, in biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, Fortunately, that recommendation, I think, was uh, uh, implemented by many uh, universities, but not all. So uh, we still have uh, a lot of work to do to convince uh, universities to integrate uh, uh, biotechnology in their uh, general education. Um, uh, also, there have been uh, developments in the case of uh, degrees granted related to biotechnology. I'm referring to courses like Bachelor of Science in Biotechnology, which is being offered by uh, besides State University, and uh, the uh, BS Agricultural Biotechnology, which is being offered by uh, the EPLB. So these are positive steps at uh, informing uh, potential policy makers as well as the uh, general public about uh, the uh, benefits and, and risks of, of this new uh, technology. Back to you. Thank you, um, Dr. Rasko. Um, Dr. Mamariel, uh, would you like to uh, provide your input? Uh, wala na. Kasi kirito na lang. Um, <clears throat> Sinuhat ko nga dito, no, I really agree na science education. Kaya lang, sa Facebook, nakita mo yung mga Pinoy Big Brother Brohaha. Hindi alam yung kong bursa. Hindi alam na si Pepe Jose Rizal. Oh God, sabi ko nga ang ina rito, kung sa history nga lang, pumalpak na tayo, tagdag mo pa yung science. science. Kaya nga, <laughs> pledging dep end. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we In terms of marketing kasi, no, products are sold in terms of what they can do to you. Pampaputi ito ng kilikili, papakinis ang buka. Um, yun lang sila sabi, period. But uh, when you have something like GM, para sabi, ano ito? Diba? Um, kaya talagang yung education is very important. And it will be a work in progress till death do us part. Ganun ang mangyayari ito, I tell you. Um, Marami sa atin mo, wala na sa mundo ito. And still, no, uh, educating people on biotechnology will still be the, the biggest challenge. Sorry to say that, but that is what I really feel. Salamat po. Salamat, Dr. Choi. Okay, let's, um, you know, we have been receiving uh, comments in our chat box of examples of regulatory capture and uh, how, uh, how they perceive regulatory capture. So let me... There is one here from Andrew de los Angeles. A classic example of regulatory capture is labeling regime when mandated to label products that contain what is presumably present but not determinate of what it is. What is it different? 
Or how is it different from the other that is not required to be labeled of, particularly if it is beyond detection in the realm of lab testing, etc.? Well, you can leave that his comment in the chat box. Okay, let's move to a, uh, another um, question. And uh, a while ago, we were talking about uh, the acceptability of um, biotechnology uh, products and um, and uh, biotechnology in it itself, no? Um, as a tool to uh, help our our agriculture sector. So there is a question here from Mr. Vicente Camillon again. Uh, how can biotechnology help our poor farmers um, and alleviate rural poverty? I think this is an important uh, question to answer because this would uh, provide people or give uh, aid in uh, in um, uh, having a greater appreciation and a wider understanding of the importance of modern biotechnology. So a general question, but very important. So can we, can I uh, first hear the answer? Can we first hear the answer of RV? I think you covered this in your presentation. So may I, um, uh, may I read the question again? How can biotechnology help our poor farmers and elevate rural poverty. RB, would you like to answer this question? Okay, uh, thank you, Ma'am Sheila. So uh, as discussed earlier, it was mentioned by um, Dr. Choi na um, to see is to believe that is the, yun yung nagpapa-attract sa farmers when they see technology working. And so um, it takes a lot more than information dissemination to um, encourage their adoption of biotechnology crops. It takes more than just seeing these um, empirical figures na mga estimates of cost and returns. So they need to see technology working. So um, um, there is a pilot site already prepared for BT eggplant and um, pag makita nila yung um, returns talaga and um, it is uh, proven that there is really a fast return on investment in their yield and production. Um, this will really encourage them to adopt the technology and the crop. And um, another factor is also the access to seeds because um, yung, um, one of the barriers we saw in literature and also um, across our interviews with um, agencies and key stakeholders, um, there are reports that um, there are high input costs of seeds. And because of this, um, may proliferation ng ukay ukay seeds. So it taps like 25% into the seed market. So um, one way to allow them is to allow them to really thrive with that technology is to improve their accessibility to this um, to these inputs. And ayun, uh, once they once they are facilitated and um, once they see that there are quick returns or like um, there are fast returns on investment in what they do. And given the evidence in the big production and yield returns, this will really aid them dun sa, uh, this will really aid them in their um, production as farmers. And it will not only contribute to their to their higher income, but also to the supply of food in the market. So, yun po, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, RV. Um, may I hear from Sunny? Would you like to uh, give your input to this question? Yes, Sheila. I think it's, it's a good um, well, Roel's question earlier is a good segue to, to answering this. He pointed out that uh, farmers are actually going to earn more once the, the BT eggplant uh, commodity is out in the market. And that is correct because in our ex ante projection, the producer surplus is a lot higher than the consumer surplus. That means more returns are going to the farmer, to the farmers. Mm -hmm. um, but still, uh, the consumer surplus is very much uh, positive. So, a lot of benefit as well will accrue to the consumers. No? So, I guess that's an indirect way of answering how would you 
better the livelihood better the for life. people within the rural communities, particularly the farmers who are planting BT egg. So, mas malaki yung kita nila, mm-hmm. mas malaki yung benefit nila actually in our projection compared to the benefit of the eventual consumers, those who will buy uh, the talong that, that they will cook in their respective kitchens. Mm-mm-mm. Oo. Pero the, uh, yung, ano rin, ano, nakasalalay din yung, yung returns, no? Kung, kung, uh, kung yung adoption is uh, mas immediate or mas earlier, or mas later, di ba? Based on your projections? Yes, yes. Well, in our projection, we actually look at the, uh, the life of the technology, the projected life of the technology. So mm-hmm. uh, there will be a lag in the initial years when you are trying to, to educate the farmers to adopt this technology. Then it mm-hmm. will go up, plateau, and eventually go down as the technology mm-hmm. deteriorates no, or depreciates. So yun yung kanyang natural life. But even with our most uh, conservative sets of assumptions, mm-hmm. we've seen very positive numbers in terms of uh, net present value as well as uh, internal rate of return. So, very positive in terms of economic viability. So, ito yung ating economic projection. Pero mm-hmm. yun nga, merong sentiments sa ating uh, other stakeholders and interest groups. So, that mm-hmm. has to be addressed uh, in a different manner. And mm-hmm. platforms for exchanges, discussions, will be, I think, apt no, to mm-hmm. answer something like this. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much, Sunny. Dr. Choi, uh, would you like to give your insights? <laughs> Uh, may I pass the baton to Dr. Violi Villegas? <laughs> okay, yes, yes. I'm sure meron siyang masasabi dyan. Uh-huh. Okay. So, uh, um, I... Yes, sir. Sige. May UBN I request our... Yan, eh. uh-huh. May I request our uh, webinar team to please uh, <clears throat> to please turn on the mic of uh, Dr. Violi Villegas. Okay. Dr. Villegas, Dr. Violi Villegas, magandang umag, magandang tanghali po, hapon po. May we uh, get your insights, ma'am? Given your uh, expertise and uh, um, long experience in the field of biotechnology. Yung, my, my first point, which I wrote in the chat box. Opo. Kanina po, binanggit ni Dr. Rasko, hindi naman bago yung mga yan. Mm-hmm. And I gave a particular example, mm-hmm. almond. Lahat tayo kumakain ng almond. It used to be a, a poisonous nut, but a single base pair change from cytosine to thymine mm-hmm. prevented the production of prunacin, which is um, panglaban nila yung sa insects. Nawala yung mutation, hindi na nakaproduce ng prunasin si almond, kaya siya naging edible. But then, it wasn't called gene editing. It was called mutation. So, ganun lang yun. As we evolve, as what Dr. Rasko and Dr. Choi said, we, we evolve, we become better adapted, just like crops and animals. My second point, yung sabi rin ni Dr. Rasko, communication is key. The mm-hmm. message should be tailored to your target audience. Kung ang kausap mo ay consumer, wala namang enough science background, or legislators, iba-iba yung training, we should frame the message at a language that will be understood by your target audience. Para bang kung nagtuturo ka na elementary, sa RASCO may DNA na ho ang elementary. Nakikita ko yung mga apu ko nag-aaralan ng DNA. Elementary. <laughs> High school, meron na rin. Baka It naman, alphabet lang yung nakita mo. <laughs> uh, kami ni Dr. Rasko, <laughs> halis na namin nakita yung DNA kay Ma'am Dolores Ramirez. So, yun yung gusto kong message na na i-project. Sabi nga nung aking dating boss, si Dr. Lantikan, nung bagong uwi ako, yabang ko. Sabi ko, Sir, as a plant breeder, I'm better equipped than your generation because I have new tools at my disposal. Sabi ni Dr. Lantikan, of course, Violi, because science develops continuously new tools so we can better address today's problems. So, yung, yung wisdom, nandoon palagi. Yun lang po. 
Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong um, uh, insights, Dr. Violi Villegas. Dr. Violi Villegas is, uh, has worked for many years uh, sa Institute of uh, Plant Breeding, uh, UT Los Baños. And uh, he is known as the breeder of the Sinta Papaya, among other, yes. um, among other um, innovations. <laughs> Salamat, Dr. Also, Sheila, I also worked for a private company that dealt with okay, GM and okay, also for an international institute. Mm -mm. I thank you, ma'am. GM you, Dan. Yes. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh -oh. There is a question here from uh, Ephraim Villegas. Although na touch na ito kanina, um, uh, maganda at uh, extensive yung uh, uh, explanation ni Dr. Rasko, but uh, okay, let me read the question. Is GM corn generally safe? Uh, is GM corn generally safe? I think this has been already uh, answered by Dr. Mm -hmm. Rasko, but uh, please, uh, baka pwedeng i-throw ko ulit yung question kay Dr. Villegas. Uh, Lulubos-lubasin na natin to. Oo, Dr. Dr. Yol. <laughs> Is GM corn generally safe daw po? Yun po ang tanong. Dr. Pag ang mga regulators natin, when they make a decision, hindi naman nila sasabihin niya na safe, kundi may comparison as mm -hmm. safe as conventional corn. Mm -hmm. Lagi yung walang absolute, as safe as. Laging may comparison. And they will not, I don't think our regulators will approve anything na hindi mapoprove na yun ay as safe as yes. the non-GM counterpart. Tama ba, Dr. Choi? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so, sasakalin niyo ako. <laughs> let us, uh, okay. Let us uh, check our chat box for a few more questions. Okay. Meron pa akong nakita dito na hindi natin natatanong. Uh, from uh, Vanessa, well, she came across an article. Uh, she gave us the link, no, but uh, I'm not sure. Okay. She would like to ask if the one discussed in that uh, article is JDC. Uh, or is there a different genome editing regulation in the pipeline for PH for the Philippines? Okay. Yes. Um, doc Director Choi, please help us. Yeah. Uh, sa JDC, what kasi, no? Sinabi nga ni Ma'am Bioli kanina dito no, sa chat na <clears throat> kung hindi siya GM, I mean, uh, tawag dito, <clears throat> there is a part in the new JDC that tells na <clears throat> kung wala kang tatawag na <clears throat> tawag dito, there's a, no new, new, there is a a new or additional DNA, then uh, hindi ka re-regulate under the JDC 21. Kaya, ang meron, so meron na tayo, sinabi nga kanina ni Karen na ipapublish na nila yon. It will be team, uh, it will be treated differently. Hindi nga katulad ng uh, GM crop. Sabi ka kanina, it will be regulated as a product more than a process. Okay. Thank you very much, Director Shrey, for your clarification. Okay. Uh, before we um, cap this discussion, let us look at the results of our poll, uh, Gwen. Okay, remember our question? Our question was uh, in the um, in your view, what is the most serious constraint to biotechnology or GM uh, modern biotechnology uh, uh, crops uh, utilization or uh, no, adoption and use? And so we gave some um, options or uh, choices to our respondents okay um most of them answered uh letter b which is regulatory delays due to bureaucratic uh inefficiencies that's the um uh the choice that got the highest um answer or highest number of responses the second one is the high cost of technology uh, investment and r and d and then the third one was stringent regulatory processes. Okay, so as a token of our appreciation, um, we we will pick um, three winners.
from our from those who answered our poll and i will uh, reveal their names um before we end this webinar okay so to cap our discussion may i ask our each of our speakers for their brief final remarks may uh we can start from our presenters um rv and sunny rv brief okay. final remarks Yes, um, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, our study. And thank you also for our discussions, Dr. Choi, Dr. Rasko, Ma'am um, Violi, and also Ma'am um, Karen, for um, adding very significant insights to our study. And we're, we're seeing that uh, modern biotechnology really has potential to improve the productivity of Philippine agriculture and deliver potential benefits to our farmers and consumers. And um, with that, we hope that um, the regulatory process may be able to deliver that in the most optimum way possible. But also, um, may there also be um, continual um, public participation and check and balances to really balance out um, the what um what Dr. Sani says as the polarizing views. So uh Sir Sani. <laughs> thank you very much, Harvey. Sani. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Thank you, RV. I guess in more than two decades of us having uh GM crops in the country, we've seen both positive and not so uh, palatable indicators of progression. But uh, bottom line is we are seeing this novel technology as very beneficial in many ways, no? not only to our consuming public, but also to, uh, to our users, our farmers, and other stakeholders within industries. So I guess moving forward, it's us really trying to augment whatever processes we have, whatever uh, policies we have, and whatever institutions we have looking into biosafety you know, and the welfare of our uh, consuming population. We've had GM corn and we've had successes in terms of looking at uh, how extensive the adoption is you know, in terms of the stock varieties, BT corn as well as the herbicide tolerant uh, varieties. The numbers are very, uh, very good, not only in Luzon, but also in Visayas and Mindanao. Uh, inputs coming from farmer groups who have adopted such are very positive. But the other side of the coin really is you have other interest groups that have polarizing ideas with regard to modern biotechnology. And as uh, echoed by Dr. Rasco and Dr. Mamarin earlier, it's really us trying to um, imbue in them um, the right way to perceive or assess the eventual modern biotechnology product. And it's through proper education, information, communication. So I guess we are only looking at uh, bettering what we have right now. And JDC 2021 is a good start. Us having a medium to long-term target of having a better legislation on modern biotechnology, I guess, is on the horizon. And hopefully we'll be able to achieve that. So congratulations to all our stakeholders uh, and thank you as well to uh, Dr. Choi, Dr. Rasco, Dr. Villegas, RV, no, and you, Sheila, and your team for having us this afternoon. Thank you and have a great day. Thank, thank you, Sunny. It's our pleasure to uh, organize this uh, webinar for, for you and RV. Okay, Director Choi, sir. Okay, uh, two things. Number one, from the point of a regulator, no, uh, truth hurts, uh, regulatory delays, and uh, bureaucratic process. Uh, so this will be a challenge for us in the regulations. Na iayos ito. I promise within my with, within my powers and within my capabilities, na Doc Rasco and others, na we'll do our best, na. The JDC 2021 regulatory days will not be as bad as <laughs> the JD the, the JDC 2016. 
Number two, chika ko lang, ano ho? If Papaya Sinta is sumambioli, meron din kay Dr. Rasko. Uh, ang hindi mapapantayan, kalabasa suprema. I know Dr. Rasko is the breather of that. Until today, marami ng mga bagong uh, hybrid sa kalabasa, pero hindi pa rin nakayang kabuhin ang suprema ni Dr. Rasko. For the record, uh, until now, Suprema is still the number one and still the best uh, variety ng kalabasa. Pero Dr. Rasko yan. <laughs> Thank you po. Yun lang. Salamat everyone. Maraming salamat, uh, D Director Choi. Okay. And uh, now, uh, let's hear from uh, Dr. Yefenio Rasko. Sir, we're very pleased and honored to have with you at this webinar. Salamat, uh, Dr. Choi, for giving me that Kalabasa Award. <laughs> I'm not sure that I deserve it. <laughs> well, uh, throughout this deliberation, uh, parang ang emphasis natin dun sa farmers, you know. Uh, but let's not forget na yung benefits ng uh, biotech products uh, goes beyond uh, farmers. Uh, in fact, I would look at the benefit to consumers in terms of consumer health uh, and nutrition. In the case of uh, BT eggplant, uh, that means avoiding yung mga uh, harmful chemicals, pesticides that farmers have been using to control uh, fruit and shoot borer. So with the use of this BT eggplant, uh, this chemical residues uh, will be reduced. At the same time, we can uh, be assured of uh, a higher level of safety in farming. Hindi lang profit and benefit ng farmers with the use of a product like BT Ekman, but less exposure to harmful pesticides. One study I remember says that uh, a typical eggplant farmer would spray as much as uh, 80 times uh, during the growing season uh, and spraying maybe two times a week of pesticides that are extremely toxic. So uh, with the use of biotechnology, this can be reduced. In the case of uh, uh, golden rice, uh, that means uh, reducing the suffering of uh, children and other consumers who are uh, vitamin A uh, deficient. Uh, and this leads me to the final word that I'd like to emphasize, that uh, all these benefits are delayed uh, because of regulations that are actually self-inflicted. Tayo yung nag-approve ng Cartagena Protocol, tayo rin yung nag-formulate no regulations based on that protocol. Pwede rin natin balik ta rin yung lahat na yan. We can repudiate all these regulations and uh, make an exit from uh, an international agreement that I said is based on uh, an assumption that is no longer scientifically defensible today. Siguro nung panahon na nagdi-deliberate sila sa Cartagena Protocol, okay yung assumption na yon. But we have learned a lot since then. And we now know that that assumption is wrong. So if we are going to insist on scientific basis for our decisions, the first decision we should make is get out of the Cartagena Protocol and that will effectively eliminate all these regulations that are based on that Cartagena protocol. Thank you very much and I uh, really enjoy the uh, exchange of ideas and uh, the questions that were raised by the participants. And thank you very much Dr. Rasko. So friends, please join me in thanking our presenters Dr. Sunny Domingo and Ms. R.B. Joy Manihar and our reactors Dr. Vivencio Mamarid and Dr. Yefemio Rasko and also uh, we would like to thank uh, Ms. Karen Panasso of uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture and also Dr. Violi Villegas for their inputs.
So please uh, give all of them a well-deserved virtual clap. Okay, so before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our um, opinion poll. So, okay, let me uh, check who they are. Okay, from Webex, uh, Ruther, Ruther and Sean Colong and Julie Ann Bacayo. Ruther, Sean Colong and Julie Ann Bacayo. And from Facebook, Senshi Ragwindin. Okay, so uh, Ruther, Julie, and Senshi, our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. Okay, so and finally, we have uh, some reminders. Okay. So friends, you can access all the presentations from today's uh, webinar from uh, the PIDS uh, website. Um, so flash on the screen is um, the link to our website. Um, and we will, okay, also the link to the full study, not just the presentations. Okay. And um, Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also email, email you uh, the link after the event. Your comments are very important to us to improve our virtual events. And um, next, also, please uh, regularly visit our website and uh, social media pages. We have a YouTube channel which contains the recordings of our um, seminars and webinars. Okay, and uh, we we also we also uh, are grateful to those who um, watch this webinar on on Facebook and also who uh, followed the live updates in on our Twitter account. And uh, we have a very busy month. Uh, okay, on April twenty five, which is going to be next week, we will have a um, a. Uh, a public uh, um, webinar um, on focusing on capabilities. Title is Focusing on Capabilities for Social Protection, a Collection of Studies. This is going to be delivered by uh, Dean Carlan. Of, uh, and uh, this is going to be from 2 p.m. to 3.30 via Facebook uh, Live. Okay, Dean Carlan is, from, is the head of Innovations for, for uh, innovations for Poverty Action. And on May 5, okay, we have four public events. On May 5, we have the Surti Knowledge Sharing Forum on Learning and Moving Forward from the COVID-19 Pandemic Recommendations for the Incoming Administration. So this uh, public uh, webinar will feature um, some of the uh, knowledge, uh, some of the studies uh, produced by our partner institutions such as CIRCA, such as the LSU um, Angel Looking Institute, uh, DOLEM, Institute of Labor Studies, and others. Okay? And then on May 17, we have the PASCN FSI Symposium on Circular Economy in the Philippines and, A and APEC, Perspectives, Experiences, and Pathways. Okay? So that is, that is uh, in the morning uh, of May 17 via Zoom. And on May 19, we will have our public webinar on assessing the implementation of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act. This was re rescheduled from April 28. So for those of you who have already registered to this event, please uh, take note that it was moved to May 19. We will um, send you an email about uh, um, as a reminder to remind you that it has been moved to another day. Okay. And on May 26, we will have the launch of the PIDS book, The Philippines Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic, Learning from Experience and Emerging Stronger to Future Shock. So watch out for those uh, webinars. So if you can't register, then just um, tune in to our Facebook page for the uh, live stream. Okay? And... Um, Finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academy, civil society, business, and international development community who join us today. So friends, this concludes our webinar for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you uh, next Monday for our uh, uh, public webinar on Facebook Live. Maraming salamat po.